distinguish between the Lord's church, the one that is described for us in the New Testament, and all of the various religious organizations that exist otherwise? Well, the answer is, as we've already stated, within the Scriptures themselves. God has not only given us notification through His Word that the church is in existence, but He has given us many identifying marks of that New Testament church. In our study last week, we talked about the founder and the foundation. Jesus, of course, is the one who is the founder of the church. He's the one who promised to build it. It, uh, And any church that was not founded by Him is not His. We also looked at the foundation of the church in that same lesson. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul said, Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid Jesus Christ. Any religious organization that has any other foundation is not the Lord's church, does not meet that identifying mark, and thus should be cast aside as that which originated with men. So those are just two of the many identifying marks that we shall discuss in the next several weeks. In our study tonight, we want to look at the time and place of beginning. Now, some of these passages we have looked at in connection with other points relative to the church. It's, it's uh, practically impossible to, to cover all of these different lessons without having some repetition of scriptures and the use of those scriptures, although most of the time we use those same scriptures to emphasize other points within those scriptures. So while we use them over and over and over, yet we draw different points from them as we go through. When we think back to the lesson on the church and the kingdom, that was a couple of three weeks ago, we looked at points that would help us understand that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. Again, that is contrary to most religious thinking of our day. Most people believe that the church, or that we're now living in what they would refer to as the church age, and it will continue. They can't tell you how long it will continue. But when it is over, then the Lord will return and will set up His kingdom and will reign on David's throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. You'll recognize that as a portion of the teachings of premillennialism. But in our study we noted all of the similarities <clears throat> between the church and the kingdom, noting that there were many similarities and not one single difference. They're the same institution. And as we concluded that particular lesson, we noted that to refer to this institution as the church <clears throat> or the kingdom is simply referring to it from a different angle, if you please, from a different standpoint. The word church means what? called out. People are called out of the world. By what process? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so those who are obedient to that gospel are the called out. Those who have been called and those who have responded to that call. And so as Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. The church is a separated group of people. So when we talk about the church, that's what we're talking about. When we use the term kingdom, we're talking more in terms of its government. Who is the king of that kingdom? Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul refers to Him in writing to Timothy as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the king <clears throat> over His kingdom. Who then are the citizens of that kingdom? <clears throat> the same people who have been obedient to the gospel, those saints and faithful brethren, we've noted that already, from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then combining with that verse 13. Those who are saints and faithful brethren in Colossae have been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son, verse 13. And so... When we talk about the kingdom, we're talking more in the governmental aspect of it. 
not in the called out aspect of it. So same institution, different aspect. So when we begin to think about the time and place of beginning, we'll look at verses that deal with both the church and the kingdom. And we can accurately do that because they are one in the same institution. So to identify its time and place of beginning will help us to distinguish the Lord's church from the religions of men. Every religion has a time and place of beginning. A very interesting study, and maybe one of these days it might be a good follow-up to this study, I don't know. But maybe at some point we could do a study of the church, the falling away, the reformation, and restoration, and help us to understand from the church as we are studying it right now, how did those departures take place? When did they take place? Who led the departures? What was the reason for them? And then efforts to reform the Roman Catholic Church, and then efforts in later years to restore the New Testament Church. But every religious organization has a time and place of beginning. <clears throat> and as we get through this study, when we learn the time, we learn the place. Any church that did not have its beginning there and then is not the New Testament church. Just another two of the many identifying marks that we have given to us in the Scriptures by our Lord. So when we look at the place of beginning... We would suggest in the outset that Jerusalem is the place of beginning. We'll go back to the Old Testament to begin in Isaiah chapter 28. Now, uh, when we get to the time of beginning, we can also use Isaiah 2. But in Isaiah chapter 28, and in verse 16, Isaiah prophesied, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now we've looked at this passage in connection with Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 16. When He said to Peter and the other apostles that upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus Christ, that foundation bedrock upon which the church of our Lord and Savior is built. He's also referred to as the chief cornerstone, as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and some of those passages we have looked at previously. And so he's referred to here in that regard. Now, turn over to Acts chapter 4 uh, just briefly. And notice a comparison in that regard. In Acts chapter 4, verses, um, let me get there, verses 11 and 12. Let's begin with verse 10. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10. Be it known unto you all, and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now what's happened in this regard? Well, what's, he, what's, he, what's he talking about here in the background of this? All right, there's been a miracle performed, and there's some question as to, to how it came about. What happened? How was it done? And so uh, that it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what does he say? This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. So Luke here, in record of what is taking place, is using the same language relative to Christ that Isaiah used back in Isaiah chapter 28, which was a prophecy of things to come. But the key in this verse is, Behold, I lay in... Zion. What is that? 
What is Zion? Another name for Jerusalem. And so you could just as adequately put in there without any violation, Behold, I lay in Jerusalem for a foundation. So what Isaiah is prophesying in this regard is that the foundation of the Lord's church is going to be laid in Zion, in Jerusalem, if you please, in that regard. Then um, in the next to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, in uh, chapter 1 and in verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. Now, whose house is going to be built in Jerusalem? The Lord's house, God's house. Now, you might think about that in connection in a few minutes with another point. We're going to go to Isaiah 2, as I mentioned. But what did Isaiah say? It's come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains all above the hills, so forth. All right. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 15, what is the house of the Lord? House of God. Huh? It's the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 15. So when we go back and we read Isaiah chapter 2, we read Isaiah chapter 28, we read Zechariah chapter 1, and we read about the Lord's house and the foundation of it being laid in Zion, in Jerusalem. What are we beginning to pinpoint? The place of its beginning. So when we can do that, then we begin to look at other religious organizations. Where did they have their beginning? And if the answer is any answer other than Jerusalem, then one of the identifying marks is out of order. Remember that, that child that was lost that we talked about? And all of the identifying marks, the color of the hair, color of the eyes, you know, clothes had on, scars, whatever. You find that child, or at least one that's really close, but the eyes are the wrong color. You bring that child to the parents, say, we found it. Perfect description, except for the eyes, but that's pretty close. Mom, Dad's going to say, that's fine, that's close enough. No, no. One identifying mark is enough to discredit that child from being the proper child. How many identifying marks of the Lord's church must we have in order to know that we have what we're looking for? Every single one of them. We can't ignore any of them. That includes the place of beginning. Now in Acts chapter 1, and this gets into some New Testament uh, uh, matters and the beginning of the preaching of the gospel, but just prior to Jesus' ascension back into heaven in uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, he said uh, unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in, what? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Where was He going to begin? In Jerusalem. When Jesus told the apostles to, to wait for that power to come from on high. They needed that power to give them the message that they were to preach and to confirm that message. Where were they told to go? Luke chapter 24. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So that's what Jesus is saying. You're going to begin in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the innermost parts of the earth. Again, Isaiah chapter 2 makes that uh, same observation. The power was to come in Jerusalem. That was Luke chapter 24 and in verse 49. Then you may recall, and we've used this passage before as well, Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, our Lord said, There be some of them that stand here that shall not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom 
come with power. Now where's the power going to come? The Jerusalem came with the Holy Spirit. If the kingdom is going to come with power, the power came in Jerusalem. Where did the kingdom come to begin? Jerusalem. Can't separate those. Tie all of those verses together. And it makes a very clear observation in that regard. Where were the keys first used? You remember Jesus said when He promised to Peter upon this rock and, and the other apostles, that on this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys are what? Authority, means of entrance. When did they begin to use those keys? Acts chapter 2, first Pentecost at the resurrection of Christ. Where were they? In Jerusalem. There were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout Jews out of every nation under heaven. That's where that first complete gospel sermon of the death, reality of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ took place. Acts chapter 2. Now, so you, with these scriptures in mind, it's not that difficult to pinpoint the place of the beginning of the Lord's church. And so if we find some religious organization and we have question about it, you begin to look up its history, you find beginning place, Rome. What are you going to do with that one? You're going to have to discard it. Why? Wrong beginning place. The Lord's church began in Jerusalem. You look at another religious organization and you go search through its history and you find its beginning, Scotland. What are you going to do with it? Cast it aside. Why? Because its beginning is not in Jerusalem, it's not the Lord's church. And you can do that with every religious organization and should do it with every religious organization. These are not things that we can just shrug off. If we want to be sure that we are where we need to be. The Sunday morning Bible class studying in 1 Peter, and I've mentioned this passage several times, but in um, 1 Peter chapter, uh, uh, chapter 5 and in verse latter part of verse 12, notice what Peter says to these brethren. He's trying to encourage them not to turn aside from the faith where they are. And he says, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So what he's basically saying is what you have done, who you are, the kind of people you are, all of the things that he talks about in that book tells you that you are where you need to be. Well, can't we do the same thing with the church of our Lord? When we look at all of the identifying marks, what are they going to tell us? We either are or are not where we need to be. And so if I am in a religious organization and I begin to trace its history back and I find out that it did not begin in Jerusalem, suppose it began in Samaria. That's pretty close to Jerusalem. Suppose it began in Bethlehem. That's at least in the same country. It doesn't matter how close it is. If it did not begin in Jerusalem, it is not the Lord's church. It may have a lot of other similarities. And thereby many people could be deceived. But that one identifying mark can cause us to call, discard, whatever word you want to use, with all due respect, any religious organization that did not have its beginning in Jerusalem. So what about the time of beginning? Now we've talked about this, these passages before. But in Isaiah chapter 2, it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, when did the last days begin? How do we know that? Peter tells us that in Acts 2, doesn't he? With regard to the coming of the Holy Spirit, those men, those apostles began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
There was some confusion. What's going on here? Oh, these guys are drunk. What'd Peter say? No, no. No, no, they're not drunk. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. So Peter says, by way of interpretation of Joel's prophecy, Joel 2.28, that what is happening on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ is what Joel said would come to pass in the last days. Therefore, first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ is in the last days. Now, how long do those last days last? Well, they're still going, aren't they? The last days have been around now for a few hundred years, haven't they? Now, that's not the kind of language you'll hear from the general religious world. You'll hear folks using phrases such as end times. Or you'll even hear them use sometimes the idea of, of last days. We, we, we're getting close to the last days. And usually by that, they, if you've ever noticed, if, if you keep up with this, and I know some of us are a little old now and start keeping diaries on things like this, but some of you that are a little younger might want to do this. Every time there is an earthquake or a new war that begins, make a note of religious teachers who refer to end times or the last days are getting close based on a misinterpretation of Matthew chapter 24 concerning wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and so forth. Now, if that happens this year, I guarantee you, I haven't heard, I haven't been listening to the news very closely, but my guess is that was probably referenced with, with regard to the earthquake in Haiti. Has anybody heard anything about that? Probably has been. If it happens again, another war breaks out next year, hopefully it won't, but if it does, I guarantee you, some of these TV prophets, see, that's what Isaiah said. Here's the beginning of the last days. They're getting close. Folks, according to Peter, and he's an inspired apostle, incidentally, says that the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ was in the last days. And we've been in them ever since. And we'll be in them until time is no more. And so don't be thrown off by the premillennial language relative to the last days. So Isaiah said it shall come to pass in the last days at the mountain of the Lord's house. And we've already just got through talking about that. The house is the church, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I think that should be verse 15 instead of 13 if your notes read like mine. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. <clears throat> they that gladly received the word were baptized. There were added that day about 3,000 souls. And in verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily. So there's a continuation of adding to the church on a regular basis those who are being saved. So this is the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ as already noted uh, in previous comments. Now turn back to Daniel chapter 2 a minute. We've referenced this a time or two. We've can't spend uh, uh, much time here. But in, in Daniel chapter 2, you'll notice Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel telling the interpretation of it, beginning in verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. He begins to talk about... Uh, the matter, then he says in the latter part, last phrase of verse 38, Thou art this head of gold. And so he presents that head of gold. There, then he mentions other kingdoms in that regard. After the Babylonian kingdom, he said a second will come. It's re usually referred to as the Macedonian kingdom. Then there's going to be a third. Matter of fact, he mentions that in the, in the same verse, verse 39. After these shall arise another, 
in fear to thee, and another third kingdom. There's the Grecian. Then the fourth, in verse 40, and if you just follow regular history, he brings you right down to the days of the Roman kingdom, historically speaking. Then you drop down to verse 44, and in the days of these kings, what kings? Well, he's led you down to the fourth kingdom. There's not a fifth, there's not a sixth, there's not a seventh. Yes, there is a dividing according to uh, verse latter part of verse 40. You've got the feet, the toes, part of clay, part of iron, so forth. The kingdom shall be divided, not overtaken, not overcome, not replaced, but divided. What happened to the Roman kingdom? Province here, province there, province there, different rulers over each one, but all still under the oversight and under the leadership of the Roman government. So in the days of these kings, the Roman kings, well, who was in power around surrounding the events of the time of Acts chapter 2? Rome. So what, I, what Daniel prophesies in that regard is exactly what Isaiah prophesies in that regard. Now, we've listed a few other possibilities here. According to men, Calvinists would have us believe that the church has been in existence ever since the time of Eden. Some would have us believe that the church has been in existence ever since the days of Abraham. Some would have us believe that the church came into existence during the time of John the Immerser, and I put that word in there for purpose, John the Baptist. Does that tell us that John was a member of the Baptist church? The literal rendering of that word is John the Baptizer, John the Immerser. No reference to John being a part of any particular religious organization by, by simply making that statement. Others would have us believe that the church began by Christ when He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember Elijah wanted to build those three tabernacles, one for Christ, one for Moses, one for Elias. The voice from heaven said this, Christ is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Some believe the church began right there. Others would have us believe that the church began in that upper room at Last Supper. Jesus' statement on this rock, I will build my church, eliminates basically all of those. But then think about it. If the church began before Christ died, and all of these would have it falling into that time period, wouldn't it? If the church began before Christ died, what are the consequences? Number one, what are you going to do about a foundation? Remember Jesus said in Matthew 16, Upon this rock I will build my church. Before Christ died, and if you remember in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, what was the ultimate proof of the Sonship of Christ? The fact that He was indeed the Son of God. What was the ultimate proof? Resurrection from the dead. Romans 1 verse 4. Prior to that point, He had proven Himself to be the Son of God in various ways. John said in John 20, 30, and 31, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. But the ultimate proof, according to Paul in Romans 1, was His resurrection from the dead. Suppose Christ had done all of those miracles, hung on that cross, buried in that tomb, and was still there today. Would have destroyed everything the gospel is all about, wouldn't it? What did Paul say in Romans chapter er, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with regard to the gospel that I preached unto you? What did he say? I first preached unto you 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, and that He rose again according to the Scriptures. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and the significance of that in our obedience to that gospel. And so, where is the foundation if the church began before Christ died? Where, who's the head? And we know, according to Ephesians chapter 1, Christ is the head of the church, Savior of the body. He said in Mark 16, Upon this rock I will build my church. He's the head of His church. But who's the head of it if it's during the days of the Garden of Eden or the days of Abraham or the days of John the Baptist? What about the blood? What about the purchase price? What, what price was paid for the church if it came into existence before the death of Christ? You remember in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul told the Ephesian elders, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So if it was before he died, what was the purchase price of the church? Who paid the price? See, there's no answer. No spirit, John 7, 38, 39. Boy, that clock's flying. The gospel, we just talked about that. The gospel includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, if it was church was in existence before Christ died, then what are you going to do to the gospel? You're going to take it away. It's not going to be there. Then there are other passages that we have noted in that regard that, that time will not um, allow us to look at in any detail. But, but you'll notice uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, what was the message that was preached in the wilderness? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Now, it's at hand. And again, that's based upon the parallel that we've already noted that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John was preaching. When Jesus started preaching, what did he preach initially? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same thing. Not here, but it's at hand, close by. As we would say, right around the corner. When Jesus sent out those uh, 12 on what we refer to as the limited commission, what did He tell them to preach? Repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The 70 that were sent out, another limited commission, same thing. They would go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not here, but it's close. Many of those other verses have that same message. Now, we look at the time after Pentecost. That's the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ that we've already talked about. We've already noted the first point there in another lesson, part of the lesson up here, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. They that gladly received the word were baptized. They were added that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, the Lord added to the church. So what do we have? Beginning on the first Pentecost and following. The church is in existence. The Lord is adding to it in that regard. In um, Acts chapter 5 and in verse 11, uh, we continue. And there, these are just a, a few of the verses that we could look at in this regard. Incidentally, what happened in the first few verses of Acts chapter 5? What's the story? Ananias and Sapphira lying about money. It's a shame they didn't learn their lesson. They're the only ones that ever made that mistake. Not hard. But as a result of both Ananias and Sapphira being struck dead, what happened in verse 11? And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Well, what does that tell you? 
the church is in existence. Great fear came upon it. It's here. It's now. In Acts chapter 8, what do we find? Persecution of the church. This, of course, we're introduced to uh, Saul of Tarsus in the closing part of chapter 7, where he was uh, the one at whose feet those stoning Stephen laid their uh, garments. And uh, at that time, there was a great persecution against the church. So it's now in existence. So once you get past Pentecost, and I had a chart, and I don't... Is the chart in your notes anywhere in this area on the establishment of the church? Is, I don't, is it in there? should be right there pretty close if it is. If it's not, um, maybe I can make some copies of it and get it to you. But, but one of the things that the chart will illustrate is that all of the references in the Old Testament are pointing forward relative to the kingdom. It's out yonder. When you get past the first Pentecost and the resurrection of Christ, everything there points back to that time, first Pentecost, after the resurrection of Christ. And so it just, it just nails down the, the time of the establishment of the Lord's church. In Acts uh, chapter 11 and in verse uh, 22, Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. Well, where did it begin? In Jerusalem. And it's still there, at this point at least. And so again, verification that the church is in existence. In Acts chapter 13, and in verse 3, uh, actually the first three verses of Acts chapter 13, what do we find? Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Now, go back to Acts chapter 1 just a minute. Verses 7, 8, and 9. What did Jesus tell those apostles they would be? And where? You shall be witnesses unto me. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And so now we read that the church has gone out beyond Jerusalem. Where is it now? Well, this says there was a church at Antioch. Which Antioch was this? City or Syria? <laughs> Was that a question or comment? <laughs> All right, if you'll go on your maps of the, of the um, journeys of Paul, should, if you've got a Bible with maps in the back, you'll find that this Antioch is right up in the northern, I don't know if I've got it in mind or not, right up in the northern, um, find, find you a map of... Um, land of, of Palestine. Um, you may even have one, most Bibles. I was going to see if mine had it. A map of the, of the journeys of Paul, and it does. Uh, mine does at least. And if you look uh, in the far right, if yours is anywhere close to mine, you'll find that there is an Antioch of Syria right up you go from Jerusalem right up the coast, right on up the coast, you'll find Antioch. That's the one under consideration. Now, later on, Paul leaves Antioch of Syria and establishes a church in Antioch of Pisidia uh, on, on one of these journeys. So the church now, just geographic, geographically, you can see, that the church has gone from Jerusalem down here in the lower part of the land of Palestine all the way up to Syria. So it's gone from Jerusalem 
throughout Judea, on beyond Samaria, now beginning, and especially with Acts chapter 13, it's beginning to go into the uttermost parts of the earth. Because when you get to Acts chapter 13, what do you find? It's where we begin the journeys of Paul. And the gospel goes in a lot of different directions in that regard. So then in Romans 16, 16, Paul says in writing to the church at Rome, the churches of Christ salute you. And some of those other verses. Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you have those seven churches specifically mentioned in Asia Minor at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. So now the church has spread. But where did it begin? In Jerusalem. When did it begin? On the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. Now you have four identifying marks of the New Testament church. That's a pretty good starting place. So anybody who is a part of any religious organization, that includes us. Whatever religious organization anybody is a part of is its founder Christ. If not, it's not the Lord's church. Is it founded upon Christ, Jesus Christ, the Son of God? If not, it's not the Lord's church. Did it start in Jerusalem? If it didn't, it's not the Lord's church. Did it begin on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ? If not, it's not the Lord's church. It doesn't take all four of those to discredit any religious organization. It only takes one of them. But most any religious organization you want to look at are going to fall on its face on the very first four that we've looked at. Lord willing, next Wednesday we'll continue to look at some other identifying marks of the New Testament church.